He was a fairly broken man. Um, he had changed. And when Ross and Mary came over for a visit after the war, in fact, they, they went to New York uh, Christmas, Jan uh, New Year's 1946. They were there for New, uh, New Year's Eve 1945. And Willem became ill in New York and had to have surgery. And she called her old boss, Ross Faulkner, who arranged for a doctor, and it was the French hospital there. They operated on him. He did recover. But uh, even the doctor at that time said he drinks far too much, far too much than is, than is healthy, healthy for him. Uh, but he insisted on doing that. And finally, um, um, Mary wrote to the family after a visit there in the early 50s and said it's really quite dramatic, the change in him. He sleeps until late. He doesn't dress. He comes downstairs, and Mona offers him food, and instead he pours himself a good stiff drink, and that's how the day begins. And he used to say, I'm immune to the effects of alcohol. And Mona said, that's true. He never got falling down drunk. But she said he was a changed man, and she even used the word sadistic in one journal entry. She doesn't go into details. So she tries to get her husband back. What she doesn't know is in 1952, he goes to see his lawyer, and there was a, a 50,000 Kohler uh, life insurance policy on his first wife. He takes that, and you wonder why he would have left it all those years. You think when you get married, you would have changed it. But the war came along, he didn't. And he names as the beneficiary, not Mona, but Pam Hautefeld. And Mona, in 1954, uh, she went to the Bircher Benner Clinic in Switzerland, which they did before the war and they did after. But this time, Willem didn't go with her. He stayed behind and apparently became quite ill with pneumonia. And the Hautefeld stepped in to look after him, as you would a friend. But they didn't tell her. They didn't want to alarm her. She came home to find out a private nurse had been hired. And the Hautefelds had essentially taken over all the running, you know, didn't question it. In 1954, uh, Willem told her that uh, he had reason to believe that, you know, perhaps his son, he'd been told that they had died in the Dutch East Indies during the war. But, you know, just in case, he'd gone in and he changed his will to make sure that Mona was going to be very comfortably off because he was suffering so much ill health, possibly thought his own death was imminent. But he said, I've been to the lawyers and I've changed things and you will be looked after. What he didn't tell her was that he had left one quarter of his estate to Pam Hautefeld. Uh, and under Dutch law, he told her, if my son shows up, if on the very remote chance, he's only entitled to two thirds of the estate, the rest would be yours. Turns out, under Dutch law at the time, the son was entitled to three quarters of the estate. So I'm really bad with math, but I know what one quarter and three quarters adds up to. So in 1956, in April 1956, Willem became quite ill. And um, in her journal, and, and I won't go into details about it, but in her journal she writes that I was accustomed to leaving them alone, letting them have their time. Apparently he used to go on Mondays and spend time with Pam until Pete got home and then Pete, they would have supper together, the three of them, and then Pete would go off to tend the horses and Willem would go home to Mona. And there are entries in her journal uh, in the 1950s, you know, Christmas, and it says in, in Dutch she's written, at home, alone, and a sad face. And then New Year's, <coughs> at home, alone, sad face. So there was something going on in that relationship for whatever reason, and apparently even uh, his lawyer said, you really shouldn't do this. Uh, his brother Georg said, you can't do this without telling her. And apparently Willem was quite agitated and said, no, 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 I can do what I want. But he led her to believe that she would be looked after. It's got a strange way of thinking about looked after. So he died in April 56. And Mona was quite stunned at the graveside ceremony. He didn't want an elaborate funeral. And again, the Hautefeld simply took, took it over, looked after all the arrangements, big funeral, lots of you know people giving eulogies. And she overheard a conversation between uh, Hautefeld and the brother saying, has the boy come forward yet? And she was under the impression he was dead. So now she's thinking, well, he's going to come and try to claim this estate. You can imagine her shock when the will is read and she finds out she gets nothing. She got the house which she sold for 50,000 Kohler. And she tried, so she fought for a couple of years and she finally gave up and came back to Nova Scotia, still fighting the fight and was still fighting it in the 1960s when eventually she lost and got nothing from the estate. By then she'd met Harry Foster and I've been neglecting you on these images. That's the now park that was the airfield. These are the citations that Mona was given by Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder of the Royal Air Force in recognition of 
her contribution to the war, and this one is from General Dwight Eisenhower on behalf of the American forces. You think the next slide's gonna have something with Canada from Canada? No. So try to put their lives back together after the war. This is in their garden with Lee Hunt Oldenburg and her husband Rob, Pete and Pam Hautapel, and of course Mona and Willem. The Berkshire Benner Clinic, which is up at the top, and Mona and Willem in their garden in 1952. Mona came on her own back to Canada in 1948. Uh, she did eventually meet up with her husband. He went on a fishing trip. I think Mona's father uh, died in 1950. She actually was not here and was devastated that she could not be with him before he died. Now, as I said, she came back to Nova Scotia. She moved into the Lord Nelson for a while. So, you know, she was comfortable. She was certainly not destitute, but you know, Comparison, if you were entitled to this much and didn't get it, comfortable, you know, especially after what she'd been through in the war, she was very philosophical about it, but she was still had the fight in her to fight for what was rightfully hers. Now, Harry, who had been, um, he was in charge of the War Graves Commission. He had also been one of the presiding judges at the Kurt Meyer war crimes trial, but he was now retired and there's nothing like a former somebody. There's nobody like a former somebody. And so he was quite alone and no longer moving in those circles, no longer had the friends. So Mona walks into his life at a fantastic point. He's down on his luck and she is also feeling rather battered and confused. The two of them get together, sparks fly, uh, they end up getting married. Unfortunately, it didn't last very long. Uh, Harry died of cancer in 1964 and Mona was devastated and alone again. She went back to Holland and uh, in Germany and France in 1966 to sort of lay some ghosts, to see some of the people. She saw Vendeline again. She saw Lee and Rob and some other friends and said, I know this is going to be my last trip. I wanted to come. I wanted to lay the ghost. I wanted to find something to celebrate, something of my old life. She came back uh, in 1970. She moved to Wolfville because she had a series of strokes. And she also had an accident with her car and said, who am I kidding? I'm not going to be able to drive forever. I am getting older. I need to be back in a community that is familiar to me, where I have history, where I can see theater and hear music and take courses at the university. And when I die, they will take me to Willow Bank so they're not gonna have to cart me too far. Now she had the family plot there. Her parents are buried, Mary and Norval are buried there. Uh, um, eventually her brother, Ross, who survived her, would be buried there. Her brother, Glenn, is remembered as he worked for the Associated Press, died in Philadelphia, body left to medical science. You know, so that's put on his epitaph. When you get around to Mona's side, it says, there she is in the 1960s back in Nova Scotia. 1901 to 1976, wife of Major General Harry Foster, CBE. DSO, his CBE, his DSO. She was never recognized for anything. In fact, when she was, when uh, uh, Harry died and she wasn't entitled to a pension, his pension, uh, his two sons went with, uh, a, a, I believe there was a general and an admiral. They went to argue her case so that she would get some kind of, even if it was minimal, that she would get some kind of reward for her actions during the war. She wasn't asking for a medal, but a nice little piece of paper would have been nice. She was denied. So, she was to be remembered forever like this. And I've said to many people, and, and I know I'm no longer a threat, but you know, if somebody sandblasts that one day and the epitaph is no longer there, I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> but maybe putting a plaque on there to actually give some indication of what this woman contributed when she didn't have to, it wasn't like she was living her dream. She was living the high life, but she could have come back to Canada. She could have avoided it, but she stuck it out. So I prefer people to remember her this way. And I said that there would be copies of the book. Unfortunately, Hurricane Sandy had other ideas because the book is being printed in the States now, and it didn't make it with the courier company. But if you go to www.monaparsons.ca, there is a link to uh, the book if you're interested. But as I said at the very beginning, when you think of Billy Bishop, please let the second thought be Mona Parsons. Thank you.
Paul said to me, how long is this going? I went, I don't know. For the school, the kids in schools, it usually lasts, lasts an hour. Sometimes it goes over. But I've been really pleased going to schools and telling the story. And teachers coming in going, did you drug them? You know, because we've had school bells go off and buses waiting and these kids sit in their seats because they want to hear how it ends. Man, if that isn't history, I was terrible at history, you know, until I found my passion, which is people like her. Are there any questions? I, I, you know, I know the seats are not the most comfortable in the world. Any questions that you have? Thank you again. Feel free. Off into this miserable night. I will hang around for a little bit. <laughs> Before going any further, I want to thank uh, formally uh, Andrea on behalf of the uh, History and Classics Department and uh, the Acadia University generally. Thank you very much for this very <coughs> informative uh, talk.